Okay. Well, we're going to get started today. Hello and welcome to our alumni career webinar. Thank you for joining us. This is a webinar series hosted by the University of Arizona Alumni Career Lab. And I am Lacey Neimeyer John, the Director of Alumni Career and Professional Development. And I am so excited for today's webinar. Uh, we are going to be talking about navigating change in the workplace. And this is a free series that we offer through the Alumni Career Lab to help our alums connect with experts in the industries as they navigate and manage their professional careers. So today's presentation is being recorded and will be archived on our website for you to access on demand when you need to. And you'll be able to find the link and more uh, recordings at our website, which is arizonaalumni.com backslash careers. And I'm sure that we'll have many uh, questions during today's event, so please type them into the Q&A or the comment section on your screen uh, or the chat feature when you have them. And we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Josh Wyatt. Uh, we can go ahead and advance to the next screen because I'm gonna talk about this career that he has had, which is really about helping us develop um, in our careers. And he's done so much in talent development on our campus as the director of talent development for the University of Arizona Alumni and Development Program, but also he um, has been a director of talent development at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in their Office of Development. And he has spent a decade in the private sector focusing on management and leadership prior to these roles, and he's heavily involved in the case organization, where he is the immediate past chair for case strategic uh, talent management, for which he has served two years as a faculty member and multiple times the vice chair for core experiences for the Case District 5 conference. And he is also the current member of the Case District 7 cabinet. And so he has a lot of passion and a lot of experience that he will be bringing to us today. And so we really appreciate you, Josh. Um, joining us and sharing your thoughts. Thanks, Lacey. And I guess I probably need to, to update. Uh, again, as of last week, I was just asked to chair case uh, strategic talent management again uh, in the spring, this time in New Orleans. So well, congrats. building building a <laughs> faculty as we speak right now. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for having me. I'm really excited today. I get to talk about one of my, my favorite topics um, that, I think everybody has a lot of experience with and has gone through and it's really around change. Uh, so today we're going to talk about like how do you lead through change because change is something that is consistent and constant. Um, whether it's a large change, whether it's small change, helping others navigate that change, helping ourselves navigate, recognizing where are we within that, that change continuum uh, and why do we feel the way we feel during uh, certain aspects of change. Uh, so we're really going to break it down. We're going to talk about things in maybe four different uh, phases. So we're going to look at uh, Cotter's eight-step change model, which is a really good model for planning for change. And we're going to look at something called the transition curve, which helps us navigate uh, that change. We're also going to look at how do we manage complex change. Uh, we'll take a look at how do we identify the components that we are missing as we're navigating that change, and then how do we backfill those, and what does it feel like if we're missing certain components. Uh, finally, we'll wrap up with talking about our own locus of control. So how does change impact us directly and uh, as an individual? So the first thing, though, that I want you to do, and you can do this whether you're uh, here with us live, you can do it whether you're watching as a recording, I want to do a really brief, brief activity. So what I'd like for you to do is just as you're sitting in your, your chair, I want you to just cross your arms, just whatever you would normally say where you say, oh, I'm feeling kind of guarded, but I just want you to you know, put your arms up and think for a second. And then I want you to drop your arms. Now, you're going to cross your arms again, but this time I want you to do it differently. So if you would normally put your left arm over your right arm, I want you to now put your right arm over your left. I want you to do it the exact opposite of how you would normally cross your arm. So if I, I think I would do it something like this. 
And as you do that, how do you feel? I'm guessing if you're like me, it feels wrong or uncomfortable. You just, you don't love it because we have our natural inclination to do what's going to be comfortable for us. So we, we put our, our arms in the way that we, we like. So it's just a really quick way to demonstrate like change can be uncomfortable. Even if we know that change is coming, even if it's a small change, change can be uncomfortable. That's just a small change. Sometimes though, we experience some larger changes. Maybe like this picture from a couple of years ago that morphs into a little bit of a, a pandemic stricken environment. Those are big changes. Those are examples of changes that are impacted upon us. Those aren't changes that we not all necessarily plan for us. Maybe some of us plan for this kind of a big change where we're going to be uh, quarantined and having to wear masks and going around and, and really changing our, our day to day life. But that's a change that is put onto us. And what we're going to talk about today is, well, how do we plan for those changes? But then how do we react while we're going through those? And how do we help others navigate? As well as um, how do we focus on ourselves? Because that's really important. If we can't focus on ourselves, we can't mandate that self-care. And then it's going to be really hard to try and help others navigate or, or guide others through that change. So there was a PDF that we put out uh, uh, today as well. And I think it's going to be available for download. Uh, it is a fillable PDF, uh, meaning you don't have to print it out. You can type directly into the boxes and you can save that PDF. So uh, as you're going through and you're wanting to, to add your own thoughts, uh, there are plenty of boxes where you can just click on it and just start tagging and then save that PDF. You're of course welcome to print it out uh, if you'd like. Uh, but, you know, thinking a little bit about the environment and just the ease of use, we want to make it a little bit easier. So let's talk about the first uh, piece here. And it's something that's called Cotter's eight-step model. So Cotter's eight-step model is a really good starting point if you know that there's going to be change coming, especially if you're thinking about something like organizational change or change within the structure, or maybe you're implementing a new, uh, you know, a new system. Uh, a few years ago here at the University of Arizona Development Program, uh, we implemented a new CRM. Uh, which is what we use to track all of our uh, customer uh, relationship management. Uh, so alumni, donor gifts, things like that. And it was a massive undertaking. And so it's a change that's going to impact every aspect of our day-to-day -day in our business. And so it's something that we can plan for. So Cotter breaks this down and says, hey, there are basically eight steps. The first thing you have to do is you have to you know, create urgency, establish that urgency. Um, what can you do to, to create that sense of urgency? A really good, helpful tool uh, during this point is to do something called a SWOT analysis. Uh, if you haven't done a SWOT analysis before, there's a lot of uh, free templates out there, but um, a SWOT analysis is basically going to allow you to, to chart in four boxes, your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. Uh, this is gonna help you to determine what do we need to focus on where are our weaknesses that we need to fill those gaps? Uh, what are the things that we're already doing really well and how do we continue doing those? And then what are any kind of the threats or the obstacles that are gonna maybe derail this change? Uh, from there, uh, this is where you wanna start building your, your guiding coalition. Uh, so you wanna start to identify maybe who are the true leaders within the organization uh, that you wanna ask for that emotional commitment and investment. Um, this is a great opportunity to start working on things like team building and creating bonds, uh, building that trust. It's also a gr uh, great opportunity to refer back to the weaknesses that you identified in your SWOT and determine, well, who has the strength to be able to help with the things that we're lacking right now? Uh, once you have that guiding coalition, it's time to create a vision for change. Um, this is a great opportunity where you can start to determine your values, both as an individual, as a team, and as the organization. Um, a really, really helpful tool on this is something called Strengths Finder through Gallup. Uh, you can identify your top five strengths, uh, and it's, I think, $15. You can do it online. Uh, it's a phenomenal tool. We use it here uh, at the University of Arizona, and um, I'm a certified strength coach, so if anybody has questions about it and you want to reach out to, to Lacey to get in touch with me, I'm happy to kind of talk you through it, but we utilize it uh, as a team here, and it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, going in, once you have your vision uh, for change, uh, you want to start creating that, that strategy to be able to 
execute that change. And you can do this by enlisting the support of people that really want to be part of the change. Obviously, whenever there's large change, you're always going to have some people who are a little bit more reserved and say, oh, I don't know if I really want to do this. Um, so you want to go through and you want to find people who really want to be committed and want to help make that change. Uh, it should be focused on addressing concerns and then communicating transparently and ensuring that they're applying the vision that you've identified to everything that you're doing. Uh, next, we, we go back to that SWOT analysis. We want to start to remove some of those obstacles that are going to inhibit that change. Are there processes or are there structures currently in, uh, in place preventing your organization from being able to move forward? If there are, you've got to get rid of them uh, because change can't happen if you keep the same processes in place. So you have to look at your organizational structure. You have to look at job descriptions. You have to look at you know communicating what changes are needed. And this is a great opportunity to recognize and reward uh, because this is where that change really starts feeling real. Uh, especially if you're doing like a systems change uh, from one software platform to another, you may have somebody that's been in your organization for years and they've become an expert on the previous system that you used. Maybe they're a little bit worried now about, well, I'm no longer gonna be seen as the expert because I'm reverting back to, to level one with everybody else. And that can be really scary. Uh, so we want to remove the obstacles and the uncertainties, but we want to be transparent about what we're doing. Um, once we start removing those obstacles, this is a great opportunity to start generating short-term wins. Uh, you can't just say, hey, the finish line is the win. There have to be wins along the way. It's kind of like if you are competing in um, you know, a, pro a professional sport of some sort. You have to have those practices. You have to feel confident going in to the, the final so you can feel like, hey, we're, we're getting something done. Uh, so this is a great time to just say, hey, let's identify some surefire projects that can be easily and quickly implemented. And let's do those to build momentum first. If you don't succeed with an early goal, it can hurt the entire change initiatives, but it won't necessarily derail your entire change initiative. Um, and of course, as you're going through this, I'll just reiterate, it's a great time to start recognizing those that are helping to meet those goals. Recognize, reward, and continue to build into that. Um, once you've generated some of those short-term wins, it's time to capitalize off those wins by sustaining for the bigger, the bigger end. After each win, uh, conduct something that's called a retrospective on what went right and what needs to be improved. You've got to be honest. You've got to be transparent. Uh, this is a great opportunity to talk about how you want to set up that feedback and how you want to receive that feedback. Uh, you know, we, we teach a, a giving feedback uh, course here uh, in the UADP. And one of the things we have to talk about is you have to set those expectations. Um, sometimes you're going to get feedback that you know you can't implement and you just have to say thank you. But making sure that you're, you're building this in uh, can ensure that you're able to, to build off those. And especially if there's really good feedback and you can make those changes, make those changes and recognize the people that made that suggestion. Uh, finally, Connor says, you know, at eight, this is where you have to start instituting and incorporating those new and better changes into your workplace culture. Uh, when you're transparent about how you're going through the process of change and the change is intentional, then it's easier to incorporate new changes. You're listening to it, you're building it as part of that, that culture. You can include that story when you're hiring and training your staff about how you went through this and how you adapted um, and recognize the key members of your change committee. Um, you know, again, recognition is so important uh, within an organizational culture because people want to feel like not only do they put the time and effort, but what they did mattered and it helps. So what I'd like to do is take you through a story of change and we'll, then we'll go through and we'll identify kind of the, the eight step models, but it's something that a lot of people are familiar with. But in order to do this, I just need you to take a little bit of a, a journey with me. And let's go back a few years to 1997. So what was happening in 1997? Uh, well, if you either work alive or maybe you just don't quite remember, um, let's talk a little bit. About so Bill Clinton was president at the time, uh, very different. Um, also Titanic was a box office hit. Um, 
Also, there was totally enough room on that door for Jack. Um, let's just be honest about that. Uh, how about this? Tiger Woods won his first ever green jacket. His first. Uh, and I believe just about everyone wanted the Rachel haircut in that time. So let's say it's Friday night in 1997 and you're just getting off work um, and, or maybe, maybe you're just getting out of school. Where are we headed? Well, if you're anything like me, you are going to the kingdom. That was blockbuster video. You were getting to peruse all the aisles and hope, hope, hope there was actually a videotape behind the movie that you wanted, which meant that movie was in stock and you could rent it. Well, let me introduce you to a couple guys. All right, their names are um, Reed Hastings and Mark Rudolph. So, uh, I'm sorry, Mark Randolph. Um, Randolph admitted uh, that he really admired this emerging bookstore that was uh, using this thing called the internet to start selling books. Uh, I think you've probably heard of it. It's a little bookstore, it's called amazon.com. And he wanted to find a large category of portable items to be able to sell over the internet using a simple, uh, similar model in an effort to cash in on this, this dot-com boom. Um, so in 1997, uh, Hastings conceived the idea of a subscription-based movie rental service. So after he incurred a large late fee uh, when he failed to return his store-rented video cassette, he decided, you know what, let's explore this, this idea of selling new compact disc technology called DVDs. And they said to each other, you know, I wonder if we can mail these things. So they were unable to find a DVD in downtown Santa Cruz at the time in 1997. So they went to a music store and they just bought a music CD. It's basically the same kind of thing. And then they went next door, they went to one of the stationary stores, and they bought a greeting card, and they stuck the CD in the envelope and they mailed it to Reed's house. And then the next day, he said, it came, it's, it works. And thus was born Netflix. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at Netflix, but we're gonna talk about it in three phases. So their inception, their market disruption, and then their growth phase. So let's first focus on that 1997 time period. So the two created Netflix. It was not created as a competitor to Blockbuster but it was to change the way that we went about renting movies. So we wouldn't have to browse you know, shelves in hopes that there was a copy of Love Actually or Uptown Girl, but customers could just put it in their queue and then have it, you know what? Let's have one of my friends actually tell you a little bit about how Netflix works. Which was awesome. And they sent me Uptown Girls, which is also awesome. But guess what? Now I wanna see Love Actually again, but it's at the bottom of the queue. Oh no, what do I do? What I do is this. I go online, I go click, 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 and I change the order of the queue so that I can see Love Actually as soon as I want to. It's so easy, Ryan. Do you really not know how Netflix works? I guess I forgot. You're such a dick. Yeah, so Kelly described it perfect. You know, that was our whole concept. And if you were one of those early adopters of Netflix, you probably remember getting the red envelope. Um, I remember back in the early 2000s, I'd get so excited, you know, I'd, I'd come home from class and we'd have, you know, one or two envelopes waiting and you know, we knew exactly what was coming. We would plan, you know, our weekends around, oh, what, what movie is coming in the mail? Uh, and it was just, it was the coolest thing. So then in the beginning though, uh, Hastings uh, and Randolph's uh, mother, as well as the Integrity uh, Quality Assurance founder, Steve Kahn, were all initial investors into this. Uh, while Randolph assumed the position of CEO um, and Hastings was attending grad school at Stanford. So then in 1998, they launched the first ever Netflix.com. Uh, so it looks a little bit different than our current Netflix.com uh, does today. Um, and it focused on DVD rentals and sales. They even at this point turned down an acquisition office, uh, offer uh, from that company that they admired, Amazon.com, uh, before rolling out a subscription service in 1999, which allowed customers unlimited D, uh, DVD rentals at a monthly rate. And so it was at this point, Randolph then ceded the position of CEO to Hastings. Now, um, you may assume, oh, there was a fallout. That's why he's not involved anymore. Uh, it was really because Randolph really, 
aspired the the role of being involved in startups. Um, and so he said, you know what? Like I loved it. I loved every aspect of creating Netflix, but my my time and investment is far better with a startup organization. Uh, so at this point, Hastings is the sole CEO of Netflix, and he is uh, looking to, to find some capital. Well, in September of 2000, uh, following the dot-com crash, Netflix was in a little bit of trouble. So the two co-founders, they spent months trying to set up an opportunity to meet with then Blockbuster CEO, John Antioco, uh, at their headquarters in Dallas. And they offered to sell Blockbuster Netflix, their online business, for $50 million. And Reed and, and Mark said, look, we will sell you Netflix. It'll be blockbuster.com. And we will run the online side of Blockbuster. Well, during that meeting, which was with the C-suite and legal counsel, Blockbuster flatly declined. Um, and at time, general counsel Ed Steed even said, the dot-com hysteria is completely overblown. And Netflix and just about every other online business were not sustainable and would never make any money. Um, also, in case you were unaware, Blockbuster filed for bankruptcy protection in 2010. Uh, so I think we kind of know how that story of the, the dot-com boom turned out. But um, that takes us kind of into our next phase of, of where Blockbuster went. They, you know, or I'm sorry, where Netflix went. They were unable to uh, raise the capital from Blockbuster, but they said, you know what, we really believe in this. Um, we're going to get some seed money and we're going we're gonna to move into our, kind of our next phase. So instead, what they did is they said, you know what, let's abandon late fees uh, and return by date. You can return your DVDs at any point. Also, let's create an algorithm and recommendation system based on member ratings to predict choices. So if you say, oh man, I really love Lord of the Rings, well, it's probably going to, you know, recommend The Hobbit to you. Maybe it's also going to recommend Harry Potter to you. Uh, so then they went public in 2002. Um, and in 2002, they were up to about 4.2 million subscribers at that point. And when they went public, their shares were $2 a share. So IPO public 2002, $2 a share for Netflix. Uh, we're going to come back to that dollar amount later on. So I want you to remember $2 a share. So after helping guide the company through its initial public offering, uh, Mark Randolph left Netflix to pursue other ventures. Um, so at that point, he decides to completely step away. Um, it was then in 2007 when the company had its next biggest tipping point with the introduction of streaming. Um, so they said, you know what? Now you can stream movies or TV shows on Netflix. You can watch it right on your computer. Um, in 2009, Netflix began partnering with electronics companies to be able to get their app on things like smart TVs or video game consoles. Uh, and then in 2011 is where Netflix saw some turmoil again. Uh, so they had the success of these streaming platforms, but they decided, you know what? Let's separate our two offerings. So let's have our streaming service and our mail-in service. Well, they immediately lost about 800,000 subscribers. So again, they're going through this change. And I say, you know what? In 2013, they changed the, the course of everything again. And they had major success by rolling out their own original programming. Um, so one of their uh, first original programs was actually House of Cards, which then spurred the creation of just dozens and dozens of original content. Um, I, I can't even tell you how many times I log into Netflix now, and it's a Netflix original. Um, and then they've seen major success uh, with a few programs as well. So then what's their uh, next phase is when we get into their growth phase. So we just talked about that $2 IPO share. Well, I pulled Netflix uh, data this morning uh, at about 9 a.m., I think, maybe 8.30. Uh, currently trading at $577.90 a share. I think it probably went up uh, a little bit. I think I saw it jump to, to maybe $580. Um, but if you had just taken $1,000 in 2002 and invested in this little company called Netflix, you'd have a stock valuation today of a little over $1.1 billion. Uh, so additionally, as of Q2 in 2021, 
Uh, Netflix has over 209 million subscribers in 190 countries worldwide. Um, oh, by the way, that company, Blockbuster, that didn't want to buy uh, Netflix for $50 million to run Blockbuster.com. Well, uh, as of today, block, uh, Netflix is worth just a little over $200 billion. Um, but don't fret for Blockbuster. There's still one location left in Bend, Oregon. And last I heard, the manager actually listed it on Airbnb for that nostalgic 90s slumber party. Unfortunately, it's only available to locals only. So let's go back and take a look at Connor's step model and see if we can figure out, well, what happened? How do we put these in there? So their urgency, easy. It was the dot-com boom. Uh, we, they wanted to be able to cash in on this. They wanted to get on it quick. So they had to build their, their guiding coalition. Okay, cool. Reed Hastings, Mark Randolph, Mark Randolph's mother, and then Steve Kahn. Uh, easy. This is our leadership. Team. Here's who's going to impact this change. So what do they do to create it? Well, they created Netflix.com. Easy enough. Uh, who did they enlist? They wanted to elim uh, eliminate, you know, due dates and late fees. So let's go ahead and, you know, enlist, uh, enlist the support of people that want to be part of the change. It's going to bring in a, a larger customer base. What were some of the obstacles uh, that they saw? Well, they were having a harder time of getting people that had access to Netflix. Could you only watch it on your laptop? How many people wanted to, to gather around, you know, a laptop or a computer screen in the early 2000s to watch a family movie? Well, so they started working with the electronics manufacturers and adding their app to devices and make it easier for people to get to your content. Some of those short-term wins, well, they thought it was going to be uh, a win. It turned out to kind of be a, a, a divergent path they separated those subscriptions. They saw a loss of some subscribers, but then they gained those subscribers back in tenfold. Uh, part of that was by sustaining the short-term lens of creating original programming. Um, they've been able to institute that change. Um, and like I said, now they're offered, they have content offered in 190 countries worldwide, 200 um, 9 million plus subscribers. Um, so again, using the Cotter's train uh, eight-step model of change is a great way to say, where are we within this change process? But what happens when you're in change? So let's take a look at what's called the transition curve. And so what I use here is actually two different models work together. It's the Kubler-Ross model as well as the Fisher model. Um, when we look at this, it's kind of a peaks and valley. Uh, so when it's broken into to three areas, there's your endings phase, your exploration, and your new beginnings. Your endings phase starts with a few different uh, kind of feeling. You have, maybe you're feeling a little bit of anxiety. You know, can I cope with this change? Uh, it can also feel a little bit like happiness. Like, hey, at least something's going to change here. But then you can start worrying about, okay, well, what's the impact that this is going to have? How's it going to affect me? Or how's it going to affect my team? Then there's the aspect of the threat. Ooh, okay, this change is bigger than I thought. So we called this first drop off. It's called the anger slope. So sometimes there's fear at others. Maybe you feel like that change is being forced onto you, or you start feeling a little bit of anger at yourself. And if you choose not to go down that fear slope, if you get to that peak of happiness and say, um, I don't think I want to do this, you can start spinning off into a little bit of denial. You know, change, what change? We're not going to have any of that change. Well, it's important that we move through and we navigate through this. And especially as a manager or a leader within an organization, it's really important that we help our own teams. Uh, so in that workbook, that PDF uh, that we sent out, uh, you also have for each of these phases, well, what are some of the possible reactions that you might see? And then what are some behaviors to watch for? And then tips for leaders. So this is a great opportunity that if you're leading a team through change, you know, you have to be open to, to losses and showing empathy. Um, you know, showing care and concern, listening and paying attention to what you're hearing. This is a great opportunity to start listening to people's concerns because they're worried about what's coming. Once we move through this endings phase, we can start moving into exploration. Uh, so we start going down that anger slope, but now we start maybe feeling a little bit of that guilt and say, well, did I really do that? Am I really gonna be part of this change? What, what's going on here? Um, from there, we can start even moving into what feels like a little bit of depression. Um, you know, who am I? What's part, what's my, what's my role in this? Um, what's going to happen as we go through this? Now, again, if we 
come from threat and we say, I'm, I'm not going to go there, uh, we can then kind of spin off into disillusionment and say, you know what, I'm out, this isn't for me, and I'm just checking out, I'm not going to be part of this, this change, I don't want anything to do with it. Uh, it can also lead us into a little bit of hostility. And that's where we, you know, you start saying like, you know what, I'm going to make this work, even if it kills me, I'm going to shove this square peg into the round hole, it will become a round peg by the time I'm done with it. Um, as a manager, again, there are great things that you can look for, um, you know, to help your, your team navigate through this change, even if it's other peers, you don't have to be a manager to be able to be a leader to, to lead through this change. Um, you know, it's a great opportunity to start involving people to try out new ideas or create temporary policies and procedures uh, and structures as necessary. Don't be beholden to old policies as you're making change. Again, if we're not willing to change the things, the way that we do things, that change is not going to work. Ultimately, though, our goal is to move into the third phase, which is new beginnings. So during that is where we start to get into that gradual acceptance. And you might start saying, you know what, I can kind of see myself into this future, um, up into then moving for you. So what, this, this can work. This is gonna be good. We can actually do this. Now, one of the activities that we do with our staff here when we, when we teach this course for our managers is we think about it in the scope of the last 18 to 20 months where we've gone through the pandemic. Uh, and that would be something that I would challenge you to think about is during the last 18 months, it's about March, 2020, where were you in this phase? Because it's not always one direction. You can move forward and then move back because different things are coming. Um, and I see in the chat, Robin, you're asking the question about what about those that uh, just refuse change? It's like you're looking ahead on my deck. Uh, we're going to get there in just, uh, just a second. Um, so when we talk about those uh, new beginnings, again, some tips for leaders, uh, some possible reactions and things to be able to watch out for. But what does happen when you just say, you know what, I'm not going to do any of this. I'm just not going to go through it. Well, that's where we get into what is called just the complacency phase. And you can be complacent. That's not going to stop the change from happening. Um, in order to truly go through that change, you have to kind of go through these different phases. You have to recognize it. So if you just say, you know what, I'm out, um, you might have somebody that, that leaves the organization. They quit the team. And then they come back, you know, six months, a year later, five years later. It doesn't mean that they're not going to have to learn that change and adapt to that change. Something has changed in that time period. Uh, so just being complacent says, yeah, you're going to just move forward. You're not going to go through this, but it doesn't, it's not going to stop the change. Um, when you're thinking of that, though, there are some tips for people that are resistant to change. Um, you know, maybe some reasons that they're resistant are they feel like they're going to directly suffer. I know we've had changes here. Like it does. Sometimes it changes a job description. Sometimes, you know, there are jobs that are eliminated because they can be automated. It doesn't, you know, mean that we're, we're just looking to eliminate staff. Sometimes job descriptions have to change. The way that we do things have to change. Um, you know, uh, people can be resistant, especially if there's not open communication, uh, especially if we're not opening up those expectations and clearly, transparently communicating those. Um, so there are some great strategies to use for that as well. Obviously, communication is always a huge piece of it. Um, not just communicating clearly, but communicating transparently and providing education around those changes. If we're doing new processes and implementing new systems, then let's provide some, some training. Sometimes as we're going through, we're learning together and that's okay. We don't have to say, we're gonna train you on the final product before we ever go live because we know that there are changes. Um, you know, develop those procedures to be able to address staff who are going to be negatively affected by that change. Um, but just being open about it. Um, and then finally around this, there are, uh, as we go through those, those different pieces, kind of a, the, the stages of grief is really what they align to. Uh, what are the reactions and then some responses that you as a leader uh, or a manager can be able to provide with those staff? Um, it's a great list to be able to say, hey, like I'm, I'm starting to, to see this. What are some things that I can do to, to help my team? So then we're talking a little bit about these managing these complex changes. Let's take a look at another chart. You have this in the, the workbook as well as the whole chart, uh, but I want to walk you through it because it can be a little bit daunting 
uh, to take a look at just as an individual. Uh, and what we're looking at is roughly five different areas that really help us to impact change. And those are vision, skills, incentives, resources, and action plan. So if we have all of those things in place and they're adequate, then we can impact change. We can actually see that change happens. But what happens when we're missing some of those? Uh, so the first one we'll take a look at is if we're missing the vision, uh, but we have the skills, the incentives, the resources, and action plan, that will oftentimes lead us to confusion because we don't know where we're going. Uh, imagine being given all the tools to set up a campsite. You're told, hey, if you set up this campsite accurately, we're going to give you, you know, $1,000. Here, uh, we, we've trained you how to do it. And here are the instructions. Last minute, though, we're going to blindfold you. And we're not going to tell you how to get to the campsite. It's going to lead to some confusion because you're not going to know where you're, you're going. You don't know maybe where the resources are. Um, same thing, if we have our vision, but then we don't have the skill, we haven't learned how to do it, um, that's gonna lead us to anxiety because yeah, we know where we're going, we know why we're doing it, we have the resources, we know the step-by-step, -step, but we don't have anybody that can actually do the work. That's gonna lead to that feeling of anxiety. When we lose the incentive to do it, well, now we're gonna be met with resistance. Why should I do this? Uh, in, the, in the training world, we have a, a phrase, some of you may be familiar with, it's called uh, the WIFM. The what's in it for me. Um, and it's one of the things that we always have to focus on. Like, what is in it for you? Why should you do this? Uh, and incentives don't always have to be a monetary incentive or you know, a physical reward. Sometimes that incentive is it's going to make your life easier. Like, sure, it's going to be harder maybe for six months to a year as we're implementing this change, but it will make things better at the end. But we need to transparently communicate why that's the case. Um, what happens though if we're missing the resources? We don't have the, the necessary tools to get things done. It's just going to lead to frustration. Uh, so it helps us identify, okay, like we, we know what we want to do. We know why. We know how. We have the people that can do it, but we don't actually have the, the things that we need to be able to do that. Um, finally, if you have all those things, but you don't have a plan, it's going to lead us to false starts because we don't really know when we're doing what and who's doing what. Uh, so when we look uh, from, from kind of left to right, uh, what we're talking about is the change process and risk acceptance. Uh, so this is a great opportunity as you're going through and you're planning for that, you're managing change, you're in the middle of it, to say, do we have our vision? Do we have our skills? What's going to happen? Do we have enough resources? And it'll also help you to start saying, okay, well, are we looking at the cultural impact of what's going on with this change or being able to recognize why this is not working out what's the what's the feeling that our organization's having at this time it's also really important we talked about doing those retrospectives during the cotter's a step model but to go back and and do retrospectives and look at feedback and lessons learned and say okay like if we're having that false start because we don't have an action plan now we know what we need to focus on or if we're missing the resources, we need to get that feedback and we need to go back and apply that. Uh, because without these five components, it's extremely difficult to, to make that change happen and to make it a lasting change. Um, and then finally, you know, it's about growth and improvement. Um, if you're looking at the, those feedback and lessons learned, you need to apply those. You should not be doing the same process over and be like, let's see if it works this time. It didn't work the last time. Let's change nothing and hope for the best. We've got to start improving things. We've got to make um, those suggestions and find out where our gaps are and say, all right, let's let's add some skills here uh, to, to lessen that anxiety. So what happens then when you're feeling like maybe you just don't have control? So let's talk about the last thing here, which is the locus of control. Uh, so locus of control is something maybe some of you have heard of before. Uh, if, if you're not, it's a psychological concept. It was developed by Julian Rotter. And it refers to the belief that people either see things that are um, beyond their, their control, uh, so beyond their influence, and they have con or they have control over the outcome of every event in their life. Uh, so let's first talk about then the external locus of control. So for somebody that has a strong external locus of control, they believe, you know, it's like, hey, things happen to me. The outcomes are, are completely out of my control. It's going to happen no matter what. Um, and, you know, maybe I need to see some reassurance from others before I act on this. 
uh, individuals that have a strong external locus of control often are more likely to conform and obey social influences. So if they're seeing other people that they trust uh, act a certain way or perform certain tasks, they're gonna say, you know what, okay, like I can do this, this is okay. Uh, on the flip side of that, we see the internal locus of control. Uh, with an internal locus of control, people you know, often believe, you know what, I make things happen, I control what's going to happen. Uh, what's going to be my outcomes. I don't need reassurance before acting. I'm my own person. Like I have control over this. Um, individuals that have an internal locus of control are maybe a little bit less likely to conform and obey those social influences. So why do we talk about this is because especially as managers, as leaders, uh, whether it's a, a supervisory position or a peer leader, it's being able to recognize those things. And then how do we support those people. So that's where we talk about the difference between sympathy and empathy. And it's really, really important, especially as you're going through change, you know that people are having a, a tough time or they're struggling through it to, to recognize, okay, do I need to be sympathetic here or should I be empathetic? And yeah, I, I love this cartoon. We have a, a short video that we're going to watch here in just a second as well. Um, but when we talk about being sympathy, it's like, hey, that, that's too bad. I'm, I'm sorry you're going through that you know, or at least, you know what, at least you have that teddy bear. And we're going to hear that uh, a little bit in this video. Being empathetic is, and like, sometimes it's not saying anything at all, but it's being there to listen or being there to support. Uh, and it's extremely important as a leader or a manager, as you're going through these things, to recognize that sometimes somebody's just having a hard time. Maybe it's something going on in life. And I know there's this, you know, perception that life is here work is here and they shouldn't cross but the news flash it shouldn't be you know the news to anybody really things that impact your personal life don't stop when you walk in the door to work as a manager as a leader of an organization as a leader of your people you need to recognize that life impacts work sometimes you need to be empathetic i can i can tell you i have a great manager for that you know, I have three Labradors. I had two of them that were sick this weekend. And I was up constantly throughout the night. And my manager, you know, you know what? I think you just need to take the day. You can't focus. Like you need to be there. You need to be able to take care of what's impacting your work. But you know what? That allows me to feel trusted and guided in my job and allows me to say, you know what? Awesome. I can come in and I feel the ability that I can, I can do my job when I need to do it. So I want to play a short video. It's maybe two, two and a half minutes uh, long. And you can find it on YouTube um, as well if you want to go back and rewatch it. It is by one of probably the best uh, talent management, talent development, talent people in the industry, a uh, woman by the name of Brene Brown. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Brene and her work. Uh, but she has this phenomenal video that we're going to watch where she describes what does it mean to be sympathetic versus empathetic. So let's take a quick look. Oh, it didn't play. Hold on. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, Empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. 
Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So I really like this video because I, I feel like it does a really good job of being able to talk through the, the difference between, you know, I always forget about that last one there, uh, the difference between empathy and sympathy. And sometimes, you know, sympathy is the right thing to, to display. But when we talk about change, especially as there's a lot of emotion that goes into change, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of worry, there's a lot of fear. Uh, sometimes there's a lot of excitement. And we need, but we need, especially as leaders, as managers um, and, and supervisors of any capacity, to be able to be empathetic and meet people where they're at versus just saying, do this because I'm saying do this or do this because it's the job, because we're being told. Letting people open up and share what it is that they're worried about, what it is that they're bothered, and then helping guide them. Um, you know, I, I have a, a strong challenge with this in my personal life. My wife often calls me, you know, the fixer. She comes to me with a problem and I often say, what can we do? Let's fix it. What do you need from me? How can I, how can I make it better? And she's like, you know what I need? I just need you to stop talking and listen. I just want to vent. And, you know, sometimes I, I have to say, okay, like, what do you need from me right now in this moment? Do you just want me to listen or do you want me to help you problem solve? And it's about meeting people where they're at um, and helping them navigate that change. Um, I see in the, in the chat, I'm getting a little bit of a, Yep, me, me too is there. Uh, so I want to open it up uh, in the last few minutes that we have. Uh, Lacey, I think we have about 10 minutes. Uh, and just say, you know, if there are any questions um, out there, you can feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, if, you're, if you're on Zoom, you're live, you want to just come off mute and, and ask those questions. I can't promise I'm going to have all the answers. I can't make all the change better, uh, but I can certainly empathize with some of the, the challenges that you're going through. Perfect. Thank you, Josh. This was fantastic. Uh, what, we've had some questions, and as people are writing them down into the chat, uh, we had some questions come in with the registration. And mm -hmm. one of the questions was focusing on, you know, just starting and initiating change within an organization, right? Like where, where does it start and, and how can we do that more effectively? Yeah, I think when you think about it from an organizational um, perspective uh, with starting and creating that change, I think Cotter's ASAP model is a great resource for that. Uh, the first thing is that, you know, we've got to create that urgency. Well, should it be a manufacturer urgency? Is it, are we just changing because we want to adapt and we want new technology? Um, is there a reason for it? But I think looking at the, the reason and being transparent about why are we going through this change and then saying, okay, like, yeah, this is a change that we want to have. And we, we should do. And here's why. And here's why we need to, to move forward on that. And then start going through and be like, okay, well, who's your guiding coach? Who do you want to bring in to, to really lead this change? It doesn't always need to be, you know, the C-suite. It doesn't always need to be your organizational leadership, your president, your vice president. Sometimes it can be the people that have the most experience are going to be the most impacted by that. They should be the ones that are leading that change. Uh, sometimes you have a guiding coalition um, or a change committee to be able to go through and say, here's what we'd like to do. Uh, but I think if you're, you're looking at doing, especially an organization level change, Cotter's A step model is a fantastic uh, place to be able to start and uh, help you to plan through that change. 
Perfect. And there was another question in the chat here that says, how do you or your organization respond to people who say, that's above my pay grade? And it seems like this statement is just being said more and more. Yeah, um, I will be honest, I've heard that statement quite a bit. Uh, oh, that, that's, you know, that's outside of my pay grade. Okay, but let's think for a second, if it's not outside your pay grade, what would you like? What would, if you were in that position where you could impact this change or you could make that decision, what makes sense? Uh, because oftentimes those of us that are making decisions maybe don't have all of the, the ins and outs of the day-to-day -day impact of what that change would be. And we can then go back and say, all right, here's what that team is saying. Here's what they're saying that they need. Maybe we need to bring somebody in uh, from that um, that department or that division. Uh, I'll revert back to the, the big organizational change that we had here in UADP, which was our, our CRM system. And we ended up creating what we called swim lanes. So we had our change committee, but then we had different swim lanes that were you know, the different departments that were utilizing the functionality of the system because we could have somebody that was you know, in frontline fundraising. Uh, they may not have anything to do with how the prospect research or prospect management or gift processing, how that functioned in the system. So they shouldn't be making decisions by that. But within that swim lane, we had swim lane leads and then they could choose anybody from their team or department to be subject matter experts within that. So we are getting the opinions from every single aspect. So if somebody were to come in and say, oh, that's outside of my pay grade, we wanna hear it. We wanna hear it because you're the one doing this day in and day out. You may not be able to be the one that makes that decision, but at least being able to share your perspective on why it's important and why would you want to voice that or what would you like? Uh, sometimes it's as simple as what color should the banner be at the top of the, the site uh, versus what's the functionality that it should be or what server are we hosting that on? So. Perfect. And um, another question that came in during registration was, you know, and you mentioned this a little bit when we talked about the curve. So we know that different staff are going to be on different you know, levels of change and, and comfort levels with change. How do we successfully navigate that with helping staff, right? And we only have so much energy to give. So where should that energy be focused and um, what are strategies that we can do when you know, helping our staff through that change? Yeah, I think, I mean, you hit it right, right on, you know, it's exhausting. Um, I, I say this all the time. So we have a, uh, a seven part manager uh, course. Uh, so the seven courses that we do with, with managers and people that are interested in being managers. And I always say managing is the hardest job. Uh, oftentimes it's because organizations promote people who are really good at their job into being managers and say, hey, we're not gonna teach you how to be a manager. Um, but when you manage people, it's like 50 plus percent of your job is managing. And you have to find out how do you fit the other 100% of your, your regular job into that last 50%, it's tough. Um, I, I think if uh, this is a great opportunity to refer back to uh, the transition curve and that, that Fisher model of uh, change management and looking at the some of the, the guiding principles and, and guides that start on page, I think it's 10 um, on, in the workbook, the PDF that, that Lacey shared out, uh, because it'll help you to identify where are people? What are the reactions that they're having right now? If somebody is you know, a little bit more resistant and they're you know, displaying a little bit of fear or anxiety, they're probably still in phase one. They're probably still in that endings phase. Um, and then what can you do as a manager, or as a leader to help talk them through? Uh, and again, you know, just being an empathetic leader and recognizing that, you know, people don't have necessarily all of the knowledge that you have. They don't know the impact. And sure, as people that are making that change and we're the ones that are deciding on some of those changes, we often have a larger scope of the picture and we can't share things yet because we don't know where the pieces are going to fall, we should tell our, our teams that. We say, I don't have the answers. Here's what we're thinking. This isn't you know, the, the final version. Um, we're not sure. I'll help to alleviate some of that anxiety or fear. Just ask the questions like, you know, what's going on? Um, what are you worried 
you know, about what would be a problem if, if this change were to happen. Because sometimes we, you know, we, we're looking at too much of a picture that we can't see the finer details. Wonderful. Well, Josh, this has been fantastic. You, you've shared advice, not only for, you know, those of us who are managing people in our organizations and those who are navigating change ourselves. So we appreciate the resources that you shared, the expertise that you have and, and the stories that, that can help us in our future you know, change experiences. So how can people find, uh, find you or for more questions or maybe follow the work that you're doing? Yeah, um, you can always connect with me on, on LinkedIn, uh, linkedin.com uh, forward slash Josh Wyatt, early adopter. So I got on pretty quick. Um, uh, you can also find me, I mean, you can Google me uh, and throw a case in it. You'll find my, my profile through a case as the Council for the Advancement and Support of Education. Uh, you can also just find me uh, connected to the UA Foundation. Um, uh, you can reach me, my email, josh.wyatt at uafoundation.org, or you know you can connect with Lacey. Uh, mm -hmm. She can just walk upstairs and, and knock on my door as well. Great. And we appreciate everyone coming today. Uh, you can find the recording as well as more of these programs on our website, arizonaalumni.com backslash careers. And also please join the Bear Down Network. Again, this is your online community to connect with Wildcats and find the support you need for the changes that you need to make. So thank you everyone, Bear Down and Go Cats. Thanks, Lacey. Thanks everyone. Bye, Josh.